Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, my fellow uh, panel members, and, and uh, greetings to the audience as well. I was told that we can uh, start uh, today's uh, discussion. Um, there are topics um, that uh, inevitably make their way uh, into a legal conference these days, and uh, central bank digital currencies is certainly a topic that was expected to feature on the agenda. And as you recall, uh, two years ago in the digital uh, conference, we had uh, already covered CBDC, but as one could expect uh, back then, we dealt with uh, more like basic issues, trying to understand the instrument, the objectives, the legal basis, uh, the more fundamental issues. And uh, in the meantime, uh, as you are probably aware, uh, a lot of progress have been, uh, uh, has been made uh, in the field. Central banks around the world are working on their digital currencies. Uh, the uh, euro system and the ECB uh, is also uh, very active with the preparatory work, even if more with internal preparation than uh, with the press releases or, or reports these days. But certainly, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of field was covered in the legal field. So, in a way, as a reflection of this, uh, a more mature, a more advanced topic is the subject of of today's conversation, which is the interoperability of uh, central bank digital uh, currencies, i.e., how we can fit this uh, new species into the uh, international payment ecosystem, and um, we. Um, and, and it just shows that it's already a topic that is more advanced that will really be relevant in the design stage. We're already uh, um, thinking of the actual application of the of the instrument. And today we have exactly the right panel to tackle this uh, important and uh, and very technical uh, topic. I realize that it's in the job description the job description of every panel chair to be enthusiastic about the panel members. But uh, today I have the luxury to be very genuinely impressed and enthusiastic about our panel, who really just uh, uh, you know has the relevant experts, policymakers, and academics uh, with uh, with the relevant exposure uh, in the field that could uh, that could help us walk through uh, these all these all these difficulties. And in fact, uh, uh, all the panel members are actually in the position as well to. To shape the uh, the agenda going forward, so it's not only a theoretical discussion we are having today. Our uh, first speaker is uh, Ross Lecko, who is uh, currently serving as the acting head of the Innovation Hub uh, at the BIS, which is a very uh, uh, interesting and an impressive assignment. And and uh, Ross also had already a distinguished career before, among other having been the deputy general counsel of the IMF. And I recall that in the stormy days of the sovereign debt crisis, we also had interaction in that capacity. Now, even though the times are not less stormy, uh, we have a different uh, uh, problem or issues to, to, to deal with. Then our second uh, speaker is, is Jess Cheng, who is a senior uh, counsel at the Federal Reserve Board of, of uh, Governors, where she specializes in a wide range of uh, Payment system uh, issues, including central bank digital currency as well, and uh, intriguingly, Jess was uh, uh, general uh, deputy general counsel at Ripple, uh, um, a well-known uh, leading uh, fintech from from San Francisco, uh, dealing with uh, all sorts of DIT issues that would also certainly come handy with uh, today's topic as well. Um, then uh, uh, Jess is followed by my colleague Panos. Uh, Panos Papaskalis, uh, who is currently a senior uh, lead legal counsel at the uh, ECB's legal services, having been previously with the IMF and ESMA as well. And uh, he's one of the uh, leading experts in the field of CBDC at the ECB and also in the Eurosystem, in fact, and he's absolutely instrumental with the legal preparations of the digital euro. So very pleased to have him as well uh, on the panel. And finally, uh, we need to have a distinguished academic as well. And uh, uh, Professor Grunewald, in the form of Serena Grunewald, we, uh, person of Serena Grunewald, we have uh, this person. And uh, Serena is a full professor at the University of Nijmegen, uh, dealing uh, with uh, financial and competitive law uh, issues. And uh, we also read it with uh, very much interest, uh, his comprehensive work on the digital euro, uh, I believe it was two years ago. Uh, so certainly well qualified to uh, uh, to uh, attack the 
we with the panel we came up with the following plan uh, to to deal with the matter. Our first speaker Ross would uh, deal with the conceptual setup and defining the main uh, uh, issues and concepts and giving uh, a global overview of the of the uh, of the efforts to to tackle interoperability. Then the second two interventions will be more regional focus, so to say. Uh, Jess will cover the U.S. issues, and uh, if I understand correctly, uh, focusing on interop interoperability between CBDC and cash and other uh, other instruments in the domestic uh, and namely uh, U.S. context. Whilst uh, Panos will in turn focus on the euro area and uh, and uh, tech tries to tackle the issue from the point of view of cross currency cross-border interoperability. And finally, uh, Serena will have the noble task of identifying the conclusions of this, of this panel and to identify the, the next steps, how we can already actively prepare. So uh, without further ado, then I would uh, pass uh, on the word to our first speaker, Ross. Thank you, Ross. Thank you very much, Otto. And let me begin by saying what a great pleasure it is for me to participate in this panel with such distinguished colleagues and friends, I'd like to thank you, Panos, Chiara, and the ECB for inviting me to participate. As you mentioned, what I'm going to do in my uh, presentation is to talk about interoperability um, at, at the cross-border level and to take a slightly broader perspective to look at how CBDC um, can enhance uh, cross-border making of cross-border payments through interoperability and through some other techniques. I'm going to start with a, an overview of some of the key concepts and definitions. I will then look at how interoperability and different techniques can actually enhance the making of cross-border payments using CBDC. And then we'll discuss briefly the international framework for the making of cross-border payments and transfers and how CBDC might uh, fit into it. I'd then like to uh, briefly go through some of the actual experimentation that's being done at the international level to um, make interoperability a, a reality in a cross-border setting, with particular reference to the work of the BIS Innovation Hub that I, that I currently head. So against that background, uh, let's perhaps launch into the next slide. Before we talk about interoperability and how CBDC can enhance cross-border payments, we should remember why we're having this discussion. I think we all realize that um, the making of uh, cross-border payments, the current framework using correspondent banking relationships is slow, inefficient, expensive, and opaque. And it's for this reason that the uh, G20 called upon the FSB and uh, a number of international stakeholders, including the BIS and its innovation hub, uh, to look at how um, these pain points could be addressed through a roadmap of actions called the G20 Roadmap for Enhancing Cross-Border Payments. Building block 19 of that, that roadmap, which we, we at the Innovation Hub co-lead, looks at how CBDC can actually make cross-border payments better, <laughs> cheaper, and more efficient. Uh, moving to the next slide. And against that background, I think it's useful to look at some of the key concepts that we'll be exploring today in our discussion. First of all, I think we all know what a central bank digital currency is at this point, but basically a form of central bank money in digital format that's denominated in the unit of account of the jurisdiction that is a direct liability of the central bank. And our discussion will really focus on two different types of CBDC, retail intended for general purpose use by households and businesses, and wholesale CBDC designated for access by financial institutions for certain specified purposes. The concept of interoperability itself, whether in a domestic, or a cross-border context, I think, can be um, explained as the technical, operational, and legal compatibility between systems that enables one system to be used in conjunction with another system. It can, it can involve some of the technical features, the technology underlying uh, the systems, the semantic um, uh, compatibility, meaning um, the, the language and data formats that the two systems use, and finally, the business and legal rules governing the operation of the two systems. Moving to the next slide. When discussing you know, how um, CBDC uh, can be used to enhance the making of cross-border payments, some techniques involve interoperability and others don't. 
And I'd like to I, I'd like to briefly touch on the other techniques, but essentially in a retail in either a wholesale or retail context, it involves um, a CBDC system uh, allowing access to the system by non-residents. In a res in a in a retail context, this can involve um, the central bank or the operator of the system allowing non-resident individuals or small businesses to hold wallets. Uh, in the jurisdiction of issuance to hold CBDC and to use it for payments with residents and non-residents and, and possibly non-residents. Access can be allowed for a limited period, for example, tourists or indefinitely. And in a wholesale context, it involves allowing payment, non-resident payment service providers access to a wholesale CBDC issued by the jurisdiction for use um, um, with um, designated users in that jurisdiction, whether it be resident or non-resident. But this is only one technique. I think uh, the other technique, which I'd like to talk about, involves inter ensuring interoperability between different CBDC systems. If we go to the next slide, I'd like to focus on two basic techniques of interoperability. The first interlinks different CBDC systems uh, located in different jurisdictions. This can involve uh, different approaches, perhaps at what we call a single access point, where one of the two jurisdictions has a payment service provider that serves basically as um, a gateway through which um, uh, providers in the two jurisdictions can transact with each other and interact with each other. It can involve bilateral links, where payment service providers in the two jurisdictions are each allowed to hold CBDC in the other jurisdictions supported by relevant rules and regulations that will permit uh, transactions to take place between the two jurisdictions. Or it can involve a hub and it can involve a hub and spoke model where a, a thing, an, um, an intermediary that stands outside the various systems and in between them, um, either bilaterally or involving multiple systems, serve as a gate, serves as a gateway that links together all these different CBDC systems and allows them to, try to transact with each other. Uh, the second basic model, which I'm gonna talk about in, in concrete terms a little bit later in the context of the work of the Innovation Hub, involves a single system where uh, you create essentially a, distributed, a single distributed ledger platform in which multiple central banks each issue their own wholesale CBDC onto the platform. And the CBDC can be traded between the central banks and large financial institutions uh, to settle cross-border payments um, without having to use the correspondent banking system. And as I'll explain in a few minutes, experimentations using this model have been extremely promising in ensuring uh, re relatively rapid cross-border settlements at minimal cost. So turning to the next slide. That, those, that's this, that, that's the, those are the basic cross-border models for ensuring interoperability between various CBDC systems. I should also note that they can link together other payment systems that do not involve CBDC. So against that background, if we look at the current international legal framework for cross-border payments, I think it's important to remember, first of all, that there is a legal framework that governs cross-border payments in more traditional forms, particularly through the banking system. It's a collection of multilateral and bilateral treaties at the multilateral level, uh, the Articles of Agreement of the IMF, but of course, many important regional treaties like those um, underlying the European Union with its rules on, on capital movements, for example, uh, but also a network, a complex network of bilateral treaties. And I think it's important to note that to the extent that a CBDC is to be considered a form of currency, it may, um, uh, as these systems emerge, fall within uh, either this framework of rules or another framework that will need to be developed. But I think there are two important um, considerations uh, underlying the current system of rules. I think they generally recognize that the global economy is better served if payments and transfers for current and some types of capital transactions can move freely across national borders. But they also recognize that limitations to the free movement may be appropriate and necessary in certain circumstances, in particular to ensure the stability of countries, uh, economies, and financial systems. We can go to the next slide, please. 
But there is, I think, an important element that perhaps isn't referred to in these rules, but has been referred to increasingly in some of the, the work that's being done at the international level on the development of, of CBDC, and it's do no harm. And in a domestic context, this essentially means that the introduction of a CBDC should be accomplished in a way that does not compromise important public policy objectives, such as the effect of conduct of monetary policy or the preservation of financial stability. But I think that, that rule can also apply in the international context, at least in my personal view. I think it, it can be understood to mean that when a jurisdiction introduces its own CBDC, it should uh, have regard to the international implications of that CBDC and its design. In particular, the, the uh, potential effect on other countries' economies. To give you a, a concrete example, if a jurisdiction with a, a large important economy and a widely traded currency introduces a CBDC that makes it that's made available to non-residents, there is a risk, for example, that non-residents and uh, residents of jurisdictions that uh, have you know weak and unstable financial systems and currencies may wish to hold that CBDC. And in some circumstances, if done at scale, this may create risk of dollarization to that economy. So these types of international implications, I think, need to be thought through by jurisdictions if they consider CBDC issuance. So moving to the next slide, please. Now, moving from that international framework to some of the concrete work that's being done on interoperability um, uh, at the international level, I'd like to point to some of the projects that are being done by the, the BIS Innovation Hub on CBDC and cross-border payments. Uh, this is a particular focus of work for the Innovation Hub. I should briefly give you a thumbnail of what the Innovation Hub is. It's something that the BIS launched in 2019. Uh, it's a platform for collaboration between central banks around the world to work on the actual building of technological products that address particular problems in the financial sector. The hub is based in Basel, but we have hub centers open in collaboration with uh, central banks around the world in Hong Kong, Singapore, Switzerland, London, and uh, Stockholm. We're very happy to say very shortly, we'll be opening a new innovation hub center in Europe with offices in Frankfurt and Paris in collaboration with the entire Euro system, but of course with the ECB. But one of the focuses of our work is are the multi, um, the single CBDC systems that I highlighted, models I highlighted a few minutes earlier, where you create a distributed ledger platform in which multiple central, central banks each issue their own wholesale CBDC to be traded amongst themselves and large financial institutions to settle cross-border payments. We currently have projects ongoing um, or have completed projects in Switzerland, Project Jura, um, uh, Singapore, Project Dunbar, and Hong Kong, Project Enbridge. If we slip to the next slide, uh, these projects have all shown incredible promise in this type of model as a way of interlinking uh, national CBDC systems and other systems and settling cross-border payments quite quickly. Um, there are you know, differences between these models, but there are also important similarities. They all make use of the same basic platform uh, and they all allow, allow non-resident access to um, the CBDCs that are issued on the platform. There are many differences in terms of the use cases that have been tested, um, the types of distributed ledger platforms we've used, um, and some of the other specific features, but they also show, all show an incredible promise for this approach. Moving to the next slide. It goes without saying that putting a, pl a platform like this in place uh, with multiple central banks and uh, access by multiple stakeholders in different jurisdictions will involve a number of important legal uh, considerations that have to be addressed. It's safe to say, of course, that a robust legal basis is required for one of these platforms or for any uh, financial market infrastructure uh, for it to operate effectively. Um, these arrangements will have to uh, manage multiple legal and regulatory frameworks um, um, based in the different relevant jurisdictions, uh, not only with respect to access to the platform, but things like money, any money laundering uh, rules, uh, data protection frameworks, etc. And this involves complexity that will have to be managed. Um, 
the changes related to the issuance and transfer of CBDCs and concepts of finality and validity of settlement will have to be resolved, in particular through the development of rule books, contingency procedures, and monitoring capabilities that will help address some of these challenges. Uh, moving to the next slide. Of course, closely related to the legal aspects will be important governance uh, considerations that uh, particularly will involve um, the uh, central banks that are participating in the platform. And they'll have to be commonly agreed, a, govern a commonly agreed governance framework that determines rules, rights, and obligations of all parties. For example, uh, control over the issuance and destruction of CBDC by particular central banks. And the governance arrangements underlying these platforms um, will include different levels of rules to balance flexibility and standardization. Rules applicable to the entire system, for example, access to the system, jurisdiction-specific rules respecting access to a particular CBDC, and uh, rules respecting things like uh, currency controls that I referred to a little bit earlier. Uh, moving to the final slide. To conclude my presentation, I think it's early days with respect to the international work on the use of CBDC to enhance cross-border payments. Interoperability will certainly be an important element in advancing this work, but it's only one part of the bigger picture uh, involving other techniques. Uh, technical work will have to, well, a great deal of technical work will have to be continued with a focus on the technology and uh, technological design of different models, but a lot of legal work as well uh, with respect to the rules governing cross-border payments and the design of particular models to appropriately meet the objectives of the policymakers that the policymakers assigned to him, uh, to them rather. And of course, an important underlying consideration will be do no harm to ensure that the issuance of CBDC and the interaction between different CBDC systems meets the um, uh, policy objectives and the interests of the jurisdictions interesting them uh, in uh, issuing them, but also of the system as a whole. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ross, for having covered uh, so many important issues so clearly in such a short time. And uh, I was fully confident that uh, the most difficult uh, job of the chair to keep the time I don't need to care about because we're very disciplined with this. So thanks a lot. Uh, I understand that uh, there would be questions, but we will tackle them after um, after all the speakers uh, spoke already. And uh, it's it's now time to move to our second speaker, Jess, who would uh, who would tell us about uh, the U.S. domestic context and the, and the uh, cross product issues. If I understand correctly, Jess, it's all to you. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll go. Ross's thanks for having me here today. Um, what I'll do for my intervention, I'll build on Ross's presentation a bit by zooming in on the domestic payment system and the concept of in legal interoperability is embodied there. Um, I should note that the views I'll express are my own, uh, not those of the Federal Reserve System or the United States. Uh, next slide, please. As Ross laid out, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the concept of interoperability, it includes important legal dimensions, in particular, to support operational aspects like the transferability and the convertibility for a cross-border CBDC. And as we think through the future evolution of the international framework, including the legal foundation for various cross-border CBDC arrangements, it could be useful to think through to consider how the system currently works today and why it is, how the concept of legal interoperability is already reflected in today's domestic payment system. And this is especially relevant to the important principle of do no harm, as Ross laid out. Uh, do no harm to what exactly? So I'll be turning to the US payment system to discuss these topics, just as a point of comparison. But I imagine the core concepts will probably resonate with the European system too. So today, as everyone knows, the payment system, it's a public-private partnership working in two tiers. On the central bank balance sheet, you have cash and also master account balances of banks with the Fed or the central bank. And just briefly, uh, parties can tra transact in central bank liabilities with confidence in their acceptance and the lack of credit risk, as we all know. And the more parties use and transact in central bank money, the more useful it becomes 
in a virtuous cycle, more parties will want to use it in more transactions. And this is known as network effects, which bring efficiencies. But as we all know, cash holdings by the general public, they are relatively small. Rather, it's deposits at private sector commercial banks that are by and large the more prevalent form of money held by the public. And in a number of ways, bank deposits could be viewed as a system of money that is separate from Federal Reserve notes. So when, when I'm using cash to pay for something, I'm using the central bank money system, so to speak. Um, whereas when I pay for my deposit account at a commercial bank, maybe by using my debit card, then I'm using the commercial bank money system, so to speak. And while these two forms of money, deposit account balances at commercial banks and Federal Reserve notes, while they can be viewed as distinct systems of money subject to different legal frameworks, at the same time, they also interoperate in that both function as money to generally equal degrees in practice. And this is buttressed in large part because the Federal Reserve, by providing services to commercial banks that withdraw deposit cash, indirectly helps enable each of us, the general public, to convert bank deposits into cash and vice versa, this concept of convertibility. And I would say beyond supporting the conversion of central bank money and commercial bank money, bridging these two systems, so to speak, there's another way the Federal Reserve, that central banks play an important role in their domestic payment systems interoperability. Next slide, please. You could think of deposit balances at each different bank as a separate system of money, so to speak. For example, all customers that have accounts at Citibank could be viewed as users of the Citibank system, whereas all customers that have accounts at Bank of America are users of the Bank of America system. Each bank is easily capable of executing transfers on its own books between its own customers an on us intrabank transfer. But what about those transfers between customers of different banks? Um, suppose a customer at Citi wants to make a payment to a customer of Bank of America. Um, Citi debits the account of its customer, Bank of America credits its customer's account. But how do Citi and Bank of America connect with each other? This is where the Fed or central banks play an important role. The accounts and the payment services that the Federal Reserve provides, those services help to bridge these individual bank systems and allow them to interoperate, so to speak. Citi could pay Bank of America, in our example, uh, through the Federal Reserve, which would typically process a transaction by receiving instructions from Citi, delivering instructions to Bank of America, and settling the amount of a transaction by effecting changes to the bank's master account balances, credits and debits over the Fed wire fund service. So one way to think about how the payment system operates today is that it essentially operates in a series of isolated networks. Banks operate their own individualized networks with their own customers, with systems like the Fed system as hubs that link them all together. Next slide, please. So it's no insignificant matter when the Federal Reserve expands its network. For example, as Congress did in 1980 when it amended the Federal Reserve Act to broaden the Fed's authority to make all depository institutions eligible for Fed accounts and services. This expansion brought non-member banks, particularly thrifts and credit unions, into the network. And that historic instance it's what created nationwide reach for today's ACH system, particularly because the Fed could interoperate with other private sector clearinghouses, which in turn gave value to the network that a single operator might not have achieved on its own. So even today, the use case for a dinosaur of a system like ACH, it's compelling for things like recurring payments because the domestic network is so broad and as we look ahead and we consider retail CBDCs and in particular interoperability among intermediaries, uh, wallet providers of CBDC, their platforms, the central bank's role today as a network hub could be informative as well as the legal underpinnings of that. From a legal perspective, considering the US payment system as a whole, whether it's ACH or wire transfer or even cash, 
different forms of payment have different underlying legal bases and may be conducted in different ways from an operational standpoint. But each, each of them is in essence the discharge of an underlying obligation, the essence of what it means to make a payment, to pay a debt. And this could be viewed as legal interoperability in the US payment system, so to speak. This ability for users to smoothly and efficiently choose between arrangements that are subject to different legal frameworks, but at the same time, be confident that the arrangement will, like all forms of money, serve as a way to make a payment. And this brings even more efficiencies to users. It amplifies the network effects of each individual payment system. So taking all this together, though complex, the payment system is able to function smoothly and safely, largely because of the central bank's role as a network hub that supports the safe and efficient interoperation of the system's component parts. And from a legal perspective, again, although different legal bases underpin different arrangements, US payments law as a whole, that is commercial law, the regulatory regime and the supervisory framework, what it does is provide certainty and predictability that one dollar has a singular meaning in whatever form it takes. And now, as we're considering new forms of money, central bank digital currencies, well, the legal characterization of a CBDC, particularly if it is a sui generis asset, asset, and the role of the intermediaries, the platforms that they'll provide to, uh, to support the holding and transfer of CBDCs, these considerations will have important implications. In the US, investment securities went through a similar process decades ago, moving away from paper to electronic records. But here we're in the realm of money. A retail CBDC would not necessarily serve the payment system, the general public well, if it results in new services that are poorly understood by the general public and do not interoperate well with existing forms of money, including from a legal standpoint. So a critical question, an important consideration from a domestic standpoint is how to integrate any CBDC in the existing payment system. The questions of the day around the CBDC interoperability at a domestic level, how to allow CBDC payments between users of different wallet providers and intermediaries, for example. This is not necessarily a new problem, and the Federal Reserve's role as a network hub has long served as a strong foundation for interoperability in the US payment system. Useful lessons could be leveraged from the historic evolution of payment systems and the policy considerations at each decision point, rather than reinventing the wheel to create a duplicative network for digital cash, which could in turn introduce new inefficiencies. And in particular, how a given jurisdiction chooses to reimagine its central bank's network with a CBDC, that will, of course, have a critical impact on interoperability from an international standpoint. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jess, uh, for this important history lesson that uh, we'll discuss uh, thereafter. And uh, now uh, I'm turning to Panos, who would uh, continue the topic uh, from the Euro area point of view. Thank you very much, Otto. Um, it, it's difficult speaking after Ross and Jess because you know I could leave my presentation and, and step out immediately, but I will try to 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 see what I could uh, could also uh, offer. Um, uh, first slide, please. Um, so uh, the, the structure of what I would like to to tell you uh, today, and of course, um, as uh, Jess mentioned before, this is personal opinions, doesn't reflect on the euro system, its decision making bodies, etc., is to delve a bit more on the, the legal interoperability uh, as, a, as a notion, and as a notion that has already found its way into EU law. Um, Ross did speak about the business and the semantic, but there is one more level, and that is what do texts tell us about interoperability. Then very briefly, uh, uh, second slide, if I may. Uh, then very briefly, um, you know, the, the assumption and the scope of, of the presentation, uh, because there has been a lot of work done by, by the previous speakers that one needs to build upon, but not necessarily repeat. Very briefly on the desirability of cross-currency uh, interoperability for retail CBDC. 
And then how can you uh, achieve it from the point of view of legal design? Ross has already uh, given the um, presentation, in his presentation, a slide of interoperability and interlinking. I try to simplify a bit because I think that from all these models, there are a few things that legally uh, are the same problems or legally are the same matters. Then I will um, uh, deal uh, with impediments to cross-currency interoperability, and I would venture uh, a, a series of conclusions, which of course, because the issue is so novel, will only be uh, tentative. Next slide, please. So legal interoperability. Interoperability is to be found a lot in technical terms. Uh, it did find its way into EU law in 1998 when we were discussing the SFD. And again, this is financial market infrastructures to which Ross hinted earlier on and Jess hinted when speaking about the Fedwire system. Um, the SFD says that interoperable systems are two or more systems whose system operators have entered into an arrangement. There you go, the legal element, with one another that involves cross system execution of transfer orders. So this is the very primitive, you know, first attempt at the definition. You just need that the order goes from A to B, um, hopefully, uh, you know, seamlessly. Then came, well, of course, the PFMIs and EMIR, where we speak about interoperability arrangement, and that is defined as an arrangement between two or more CCPs that involves a cross-system execution of transactions, again, the same. Um, afterwards came the CSDR, uh, so for CSDs in the EU, also uh, influenced by the, the, the PFMIs, but at the same time by the, um, uh, the, the, the T2S uh, creation uh, in Europe, so the, the technical infrastructure that allowed uh, all CSDs to have a common platform for the issuance uh, of uh, securities amongst participating CSDs. And there we have a little bit more meat to the bones of interoperability. So interoperable security settlement systems and CSDs using a, a common settlement infrastructure, read T2S, shall establish identical moments of entry of transfer orders to the system and irrevocability of such transfer orders. It's no longer uh, only um, necessary to have the possibility of uh, seamless uh, cross-execution of transactions, you need to have it in the law that these moments need to be uh, uh, are identical. And then in the end, um, and now we are in the, the field of, of payments and retail payments, came the PSD2, which said that the EBA should specify the requirements of common and open standards of communication, so the business and semantic view of interoperability, to be implemented by all account service payment service providers, allowing for the provision of online payment services. These standards include interoperability of different technological communication solutions. And of course, that brings me to the last point of the slide that it is important to see what is the, the, the means of CBDC employment, because you will have different discussion on interoperability if you have account-based CBDCs and different if you have token-based CBDCs. You know, where are you going to uh, put the emphasis? Is it going to be uh, a, a CLS uh, structure or is it going to be interoperability you know, that goes deep into uh, points of, of sale? Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so the, the, the initial assumption is that we are speaking about a retail CBDC um, that has legal tender. Why retail CBDC? Because we already have an arrangement at wholesale level and, and that's called CLS. Uh, you know, you, you could um, uh, say a lot about it. Uh, you, you could um, uh, say that not everyone is in there, but of course the, the, the legal arrangement for clearing of these complex forex transactions already exists. Why having legal tender? Um, well, if a means of payment is not legal tender in its own jurisdiction, it would be very difficult conceptually to see it promoted uh, cross-border. Uh, and then uh, I'd like to, to uh, speak about the things that I will not cover, but for which there is a good reason. The first is interoperability between different forms of uh, currency. Um, you know, legally, I believe that this is fungibility. Yeah. One digital euro 
one um, uh, euro coin, uh, one euro banknote if it existed. So uh, because they, they are fungible, they need to be interoperable. Uh, in this case, the, you know, the, the legal reality should constrain the technicians to find a way to ensure this interoperability. The other part is the use of domestic retail CBDC abroad. Um, in international law, you have lex monete, which means that in your jurisdiction, this is your legal tender. You might need to uh, expand a bit the lex monete because now we can. Uh, it would be possible, for example, to say that citizens, even if residing abroad, can transact and they need to make uh, to be made um, uh, able to, to transact in the CBDC of, of their jurisdiction. But this, again, is a, a different issue. And the last issue, which I, you know, I wouldn't want to treat, is the interoperability between CBDC and private issued digital assets, because this is something that Jess uh, treated already in her presentation, and because in the end it's just the coexistence of the CBDC system with a wider payment ecosystem. It is something that, you know, as previous speakers um, underlined, we have been doing already. Call it Fedwire, call it Target. It is a function of the central bank to catalyze the market and to provide this kind of, of interlinking. Um, next slide, please. Why are we even speaking about interoperability? Um, well, because interoperability means interconnection. And if you connect the central spoke of the uh, central bank issued currency, all the rest will follow suit. So what Jess was uh, saying um, before about the national payment systems. And, of course, and this is something that in sanctions uh, uh, times we shouldn't be forgetting, whatever be, can be connected can also be more easily disconnected. Um, you know, imagine a discussion on uh, sanctions of a particular jurisdiction if all currencies digitally, retail, were connected into a central spoke or issued through a central infrastructure and how easier it would be than discussing, you know, can we intervene at the level of SWIFT, et cetera, et cetera. So that is another uh, thing that one might need to uh, consider when designing interoperable systems. Uh, next slide, please. The legal design. Um, Ross has already had a, a very elaborate um, presentation on interlinkage and interoperability, but I think that we could, um, or I would like to synthesize uh, a bit and speak about three potentials. Um, the first would be a single global point of, of issue, uh, like a central infrastructure for all retail CBDCs, um, which you know we, we currently have in Europe for securities, and that is T2S. Um, you know, everyone, uh, they, there is a common platform to which functions are outsourced, but still uh, the issuer is of the security is the local participating CSD. Similarly, the issuer of the digital currency would be the jurisdiction um, uh, of issue. Um, is it realistic? Um, well, it will be very difficult because it would need to you know, possibly comply with uh, all the um, uh, mandatory law provisions of all the participating jurisdictions. Um, it would also need to have one applicable law. And, you know, I would already see quarrels about what this applicable law would be. Um, operational wise, um, it could be, uh, and I don't want to prejudice, uh, you know, the, the, the message that Ross gave before, but it could be perceived as a single point of failure in, in times where cyber, cyber security is paramount, you know, it might be difficult to uh, more difficult to attack more systems than simply one after which you, you have control of, of all participating currencies. And the final point, the governance and the control, introducing new members, taking new members out, you know, payments, families normally quarrel over money uh, and this time in the literal sense. Then the, the, the other part is um, a central node. Uh, and for that, the inspiration would be the, the, the CLS. So it is an exchange, if you will, of, of retail currencies. Realistic? Well, probably a bit more realistic because central banks give a bit more autonomy. Uh, is there a single point of failure? There is in the sense that it is the platform that um, controls the interoperability. Uh, but of course, uh, you could have 
uh, a contingency solution and in the end uh, it is not the issue of the digital currency itself that is prejudiced it is just the interlinkage and governance and control you are bound to face exactly the same issue but precisely because the scope is more limited uh, potentially um, uh, also the uh, uh, reaction and the pushback on, on cover governance could be tolerable and then there's something else um, which is already uh, done currently and that is bilateral agreements between cbs um, you know the precursor uh, in instant payments in europe uh, as some of you might know uh, we already have agreements with um, uh, non-euro area central banks that uh, make tips um, and tips payments uh, available in their currencies and in euro as well this is a contractual arrangement which gives it the possibility to make it tailor-made so jurisdiction A, jurisdiction B might give different privileges and, and, and different limits. But of course, it fragments the, uh, the flow of um, uh, cross-border CBDC, of, of, of retail CBDC cross-border. And, and, and from, from that viewpoint, it might be not uh, the most efficient way forward. Um, I, I saved the first phrase for the end. Uh, legally, I don't think there is a general obligation to make currencies interoperable. Ross pointed to the IMF agreements and also with regards to the EU, to the EU treaty, speaking about um, a free movement of, of, of capital or, or no technical obstacles. But this doesn't mean that there is a positive obligation of interoperability. Interoperability would solve the equation in the most optimal fashion, but the possibility of exchange should be enough. Uh, next slide, please. Right. And now I have two sets of, of legal impediments that I would like to, to share with you for, for discussion. Um, the first slide is mostly institutional. The second one comes from the financial uh, commercial aspect. Uh, central bank mandate. Um, it is important before entering into a cross-currency uh, interoperability arrangement to see if all central banks can, first of all, establish a CBDC, and there is a very good IMF paper on that, and also render it interoperable. Uh, and, you know, this is a, something that is very national law uh, specific. Uh, in, in some statutes, you might say that if it is implicit, it is enough. In other jurisdiction, uh, uh, implicit powers would not do because you have conferral and delegation of powers. So this is the, the first thing one would need to examine. The second one is the, the different design. I hinted already at account and token. You know, how could it be that an account-based CBDC of country X can be rendered interoperable with a token-based CBDC of country Y? They don't even share the same uh, platform. So you would need some kind of, I dare speak the word, word harmonization uh, in, in this uh, case. Also, design uh, sometimes dictates the legal nature. An account, you know, a lawyer would treat it as a claim. A token, uh, it would be a res, it would be a quasi res, it could be a tertium genus um, that we would need to, to consider. Um, then you have complex supervision and oversight arrangements. To the extent you make your currency interoperable and to the extent to, you make your own payment ecosystem interoperable, as Jess hinted before, um, if uh, an entity in country X is of importance for a currency or for the, the, the digital currency of country Y, would such country have or claim or should they claim supervision or oversight? You know, is a college arrangement enough? Could we move to something more than what we have now? Precisely because we're not speaking any longer about territorial or national financial stability, but at a global level. Um, and of course, you could have conflicting and or cumulative natural, uh, national legal requirements. And here the, the examples are, are very easy. You know, assume the central uh, bank digital currency of country X um, that uh, has very, very stringent data protection standards. Uh, we are imposed privacy by default, uh, privacy by design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then it, it is rendered interoperable with um, a jurisdiction where the philosophy is completely different, either de facto or de jure, you know, full control, full transparency, etc. Um, would it be possible? Uh, uh, 
to, to be more concrete, would it be possible to render the digital euro interoperable with a currency whose jurisdiction has a negative adequacy finding by the, the European Commission as regards data protection uh, to be seen? Uh, same thing for AML CFT, which Ross hinted to uh, before. Um, you know, you might have CBDCs with lower limits and uh, they entail lower level of AML CFT compliance uh, in uh, customer due diligence. What happens if you have a cross-border transaction with a CBDC that has a higher limit? Which one will supersede? Both of them. Um, and then, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, then the, the second set of impediments um, to cross-currency cross interoperability, I see. Third-party technology. Uh, if you establish such a platform, uh, you are bound to, also because there is a, a high degree of standardization, to be dependent on third parties. That means that you would need to be given, especially in an implementation where you have one central infrastructure, global freedom to operate. Uh, I'm not saying it cannot be done, uh, but of course it is practically more difficult. Um, then uh, also conflict, complex infrastructure um, governance. Um, I think we, we both hinted, but both previous speakers uh, hinted on, on governance arrangements before, so I don't want to, to stall. Uh, you might have conflicting function, uh, functionalities of the, the CBDCs. Uh, so imagine one that imposes holding limits uh, or um, uh, transaction limits and one that doesn't. And imagine uh, using uh, the cross-country uh, or cross-currency interoperability in order to bypass those. So you would need to find a way, um, and, and this, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in, in T2S, for example, we, we call uh, compliance with own legislative requirements, you would need to find a way, especially if you operate a central uh, infrastructure, to make it compliant with all limitations of all uh, relevant uh, legal orders. And the, the, the fourth uh, impediment is the very uh, complex liability arrangements. You know, many parties, um, uh, existence of uh, technical providers, uh, freedom to operate with regards to IPR at a global level, uh, things that can go wrong, uh, and uh, a, a great number of, of actors. Um, I think this would be every lawyer's uh, nightmare from a contractual uh, perspective. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, in view of, of the, the presentation uh, of the design and the impediments, a few tentative conclusion, um, I tried not to speak about financial market infrastructures, but it is impossible because the inspiration comes from there. It is what we know, uh, but it can only be an inspiration because some implementations of the digital currency might not involve a financial market infrastructure as we know it. The second one is that the legal doctrine must align with political will and technological capacity. You know, lawyers running after technicians, uh, all the more uh, being true. Um, and in this particular case, we see it already because of the discussion in various jurisdictions about the legal nature of the, uh, the CBDC. You know, we move from the dichotomy of um, thing versus claim to, uh, you know, a tertium genus or a quasi res. Um, and of course, you know, that's a truism. There are novel issues to be addressed and their design and legal nature will be key. Um, whether we could have harmonization at, uh, you know, at global level to ensure interoperability, I am not sure. Um, I'm ending with a citation of a paper uh, by the CPMI, which although is old, you know, predates the whole CBDC discussion, I think is very topical. Cross-border and cross-currency payments are inherently more complex than domestic ones. And now put inside the complexity of CBDC, and then, you know, you realize why we spent the last hour talking about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anof. Uh, actually, I'm quite glad you haven't walked off because we certainly could uh, add further value uh, to, to the panel. And uh, at the beginning, I envisaged that, uh, you know, the fact that we have interoperability on the agenda uh, means that the CBDC topic is already uh, maturing. Uh, and it's still true, but admittedly, having listened to the, you know, competing ideas uh, uh, about the issues, it, it seems that within interoperability, 
at the moment we have maybe more questions than than answers however valid the questions are but hopefully uh you know very in a very short uh, time i.e in the next 15 minutes we can resolve some of this when serena will uh, summarize the issues tries to draw some conclusions and show us the way what we can do already at this stage to address the issue in position so serena the floor is yours yeah, thank you very much Otto, uh, for the kind introduction and for the high benchmark that you set for my intervention. I would also like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this conference, an invitation that I, that I accepted with much pleasure. Well, good afternoon, uh, also from my side. As uh, Otto mentioned, my role as academic discussant of this panel is to synthesize the incredibly rich contributions we have heard from my distinguished co-speakers. And I would also like to draw some high level conclusions regarding the legal interoperability of a future digital euro. Now, a quick question that ran through this panel was, what is retail CBDC legal interoperability and why is it important? And what came out of today's presentations is that the need for retail CBDCs to interoperate, also through an enabling role of the law, is connected to the objectives that they are to serve. At the domestic level, retail CBDCs must interoperate with other systems of money of the same currency to serve as an interchangeable means of payment and potentially also store of value. And at the international level, uh, on the other hand, there is a need or at least a desirability for retail CBDCs to interoperate with other retail CBDC systems and systems of money denominated in another currency. Now, at this level, the objective of retail CBDCs is primarily to facilitate cross-border payments and to safeguard the international role of uh, the domestic currency. Um, I would like to first look at the domestic level that was addressed by Jess on the basis of the US experience and then turn to the cross-border context addressed by Ross and Panos. Jess nicely set out how in the US's national payment system, different forms or systems of private and public money used by citizens and firms interoperate on the basis of a tiered uh, model. Now, a very similar picture could be drawn for the euro area. A key feature of this tiered model is that commercial bank deposits, that is private money, and cash, that is public money, are freely and mutually convertible. Cash serves as an anchor in this monetary system, and it ensures that all monetary objects denominated in the domestic currency circulate at par, independent of whether they're private or public money. Now, for citizens, this means that they can choose which form of money they want to use to transact a payment without encountering friction if the transaction crosses systems. With retail CBDC, a new system of money enters the scene. And jurisdictions that consider introducing a retail CBDC typically aim to provide the public with a digital equivalent and a, com a complement to cash. A key motivation for the adoption of a digital euro, for example, is precisely the declining use of cash which may weaken the function of cash as the anchor to other forms of money, in particular commercial bank deposits. Now, if a digital euro is to share that anchor function with cash, it needs to interoperate just as smoothly, or at least similarly smoothly, with commercial bank deposits as cash does. Users of the digital euro should, in principle, at all times, and without friction be able to change systems by transferring digital euros to their commercial bank accounts or vice versa by withdrawing funds uh, from their commercial bank accounts and transferring them to their 
digital euro accounts or digital wallets. And just like in the case of cash deposits or withdrawals, users' funds would switch from being public money to being private money or vice versa. In principle, this conversion between retail CBDC and commercial bank deposits would take place at par. And I'm saying in principle, because uh, I imagine that limits imposed on the holdings of digital euro would affect its free convertibility. Let us now turn to the international level that, as Bono said, adds a few layers of complexity to the discussion. And at this level, interoperability refers to the ability to transfer retail CBDC across borders and convert it into retail CBDC or other forms of um, fiat money denominated in another currency. Ross also mentioned the possibility for countries to grant non-residents access to their uh, domestic retail CBDC, which is different from creating actually interoperable systems. Now, in this rather unexplored territory that Ross and Panos uh, so bravely embarked upon, um, we can look to several precedents for inspiration as Panos called it. Um, a first set of precedents are arrangements that are in place for cross-border and at least partially cross-currency wholesale payments and settlement. Panos explicitly mentioned CLS, uh, T2S, and uh, the target instant payment settlement system. A second precedent could be seen in the continuing experimentation with wholesale multi-CBDC arrangement, which uh, Ross discussed. Now, all these precedents hint at potential high-level models for connecting different retail CBDC systems, and they also hint at the many potential legal and operational challenges that cross-border interoperability of retail CBDC would uh, involve. Now, my personal key takeaway from the presentations by Ross and Panos is uh, the following very basic one. As retail CBDCs are being developed as a domestic means of payment, at least uh, primarily, their potential future role as a vehicle for cross-border transactions should be kept in mind. Early reflection on uh, these potential operational and legal impediments is vital. It ensures that there will be efficient cross-border interoperability once retail CBDCs have been successfully adopted in several jurisdictions. And it ensures that these retail CBDCs do no cross-border harm. Now, if I'm allowed to take a few more minutes, I would like to draw some conclusions on what is needed to render the digital euro legally interoperable. The digital euro is unique in the sense that it combines a domestic with an international dimension. It is domestic um, in the sense that it concerns one unit of account, the euro, and one central hub or balance sheet, the ECB or the euro system, if you want. It is international in that it operates in a regulatory and legal environment that is only partially harmonized and where financial institutions are largely supervised at member state level. So against this background, I would claim that there are three broad and partially interconnected preconditions for digital euro legal interoperability in a broader sense. The first is the need to create a system for the digital euro's entire life cycle, from its issuance to its production, its distribution, as well as storage and transfer. 
Now, much of the ultimate design of the digital era remains open for the time being, of course, but it is likely that the system will involve financial intermediaries and or wallet providers in one way or another. A rule book will formalize the roles and responsibilities of the ECB as the likely operator of the core system, commercial banks, and potentially other service providers, and it will establish a governance structure and uniform rules for the digital euro system. On the basis of this rule book, participating private entities will then have to establish processes and applications that are interoperable with the core system provided by the ECB. Now, I would argue that much of the creation of this digital euro system falls within the competence of the ECB on the basis of uh, its issuance power, Article 128 of the treaty. However, input by other EU institutions, in particular the co-legislators, will be necessary to render this system legally interoperable. And that brings me to the second precondition, the embedding of the digital euro in the EU's broader legal framework. And again, a detailed legal analysis remains difficult in light of the uncertain ultimate design of the digital euro, but it is possible to identify some key areas of EU legislation that will require reconsideration in anticipation of the digital euro. And Panos has highlighted some of them already uh, from a cross-border perspective. They include, and um, that is more by example than, than really conclusively, um, the prudential regime for uh, private entities participating in the system. Some entities, such as wallet providers, may have to be brought within the reach of adequate prudential rules and supervision, for example, by making them payment institutions under the Payment Services Directive. But also existing prudential regimes may have to be adapted think of the licensing requirements for banks or the rules for their resolution in case they fail. Another broad area for reconsideration, uh, you won't be surprised, concerns the balancing between the need to be compliant with AML CFT requirements on the one hand and laws on data protection as well as privacy rights on the other. This has been mentioned before, so any data governance arrangements for the digital euro, whatever they may look like in the end, will have to be adequately brought in line with the requirements of the fifth AML directive, including its future amendments, of course, as well as relevant data protection regulations. But it is not only EU law that has an impact on the digital euro's interoperability. Member states' legal frameworks and traditions may vary quite considerably in their likely treatment of uh, the digital euro under private law, especially, as Banos mentioned, if the digital euro is issued under a token-based design. So, as a third precondition, there is a need to understand which legal impediments may arise for the interoperability of the digital euro from member states diverging private law regimes. This will facilitate a better joint understanding of the unique features of the digital euro, and it will allow for the development of uniform principles according to which its legal status could be harmonized. I dare uh, to use the word, at least to some extent, uh, across the EU. Just briefly, and then I conclude, looking beyond the EU's jurisdiction, such key principles could ultimately be enshrined in an international code of legislation, uh, similar to the Hague and Geneva Securities Conventions on Intermediated uh, Securities, 
um, that's not only a dream of us academics. Uh, there is already uh, work ongoing um, in the UNITROIS project on digital assets and private law that covers uh, digital assets more generally, but it could provide a useful starting point. And with that, I conclude and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Maxarena, for the very helpful uh, summary and, and conclusion. And you have managed to, to enlighten uh, some of the issues. It's, of course, admittedly also clear that uh, we'll be entertained with uh, digital currency related work for years to come if you want to address all these issues that we that we listed here um, i understand now it's uh, it's time for for questions so i encourage uh, i know it's more difficult in this digital format to to, to ask questions but certainly would uh, encourage the audience to, to do so and um, i understand that uh, that we already have uh, one question from lara Pereira pinto from the uh, ECB. Uh, Lara, if you could kindly uh, ask a question. Yes, thank you very much, Otto. Uh, so I have two questions for our um, lovely panel, and thank you very much as well for your valuable insights. It was a very most interesting presentation to listen to this afternoon. So my first question goes for the entire panel. Uh, I would like to see your views on um, the fact that uh, um, basically uh, convertibility between cash and the CBDC is basically a, a considered to be a mandatory feature uh, from the different views expressed in the presentations. And uh, my question was uh, whether going forward and assuming uh, that would there would be a decline and a significant uh, decline uh, in use of, uh, of cash, uh, whether you would see a possibility that this uh, convertibility between CBDC and cash would no longer be maintained in the future. Um, so this is the first question. And the second question, more addressed to Ross and panels, um, it has to do with uh, cross-border interoperability uh, at the international level. Um, my question is whether you would consider uh, uh, feasible to achieve this global interoperability at all. And what I mean is um, uh, how far along are we uh, to really see a truly global and single platform aggregating all of the CBDCs uh, come to light, um, given all the different uh, uh, hurdles and technical and legal challenges that have come to light with your with your uh, presentations. Thank you very much. So I leave it to panel members who would uh, take up the questions. Unless you might need to start. I I I have no problem uh, starting. Um, Thanks a lot, Lara, for, for the questions. So the, the, the first one with regards to convertibility, um, again, assuming that they are legal tender, um, for me, legally, and I know I'm very rigid and dogmatic, but there needs to be a one-to-one -one convertibility, taking into consideration any holding limits that uh, you might have on, on the, the, the digital currency, of course. Um, now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so naive so as not to know that the cash has a different cost than the digital currency. And also this convertibility will have a cost. Uh, and also the legal tender uh, implies the acceptance at full face value, which means with no surcharges, which means someone, um, you know, ends up holding the, uh, the short end of, of, of the stick on, on this one. And it cannot be the, the, the end user. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, uh, it is a new project. It has its costs. We just, one just need to find the, the way of, um, uh, allocating it, uh, in respect of, of, of the principle of, of legal tender and also financial, uh, reality. Uh, so it, it is a, a question of technical uh, adaptability, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And then the, you know, your second question. I would certainly hope so, but of course it all depends 
on the needs uh, of having cross uh, uh, currency interoperability, uh, cross currency, cross digital currency interoperability. It might be that some jurisdictions are not yet ready for it, but the technical possibility for them to be able to issue should be there. Um, maybe if I might uh, pick up on Panos's comments, which I, I, I certainly agree with, um, you know, with respect to the idea of creating some sort of global uh, framework, obviously, <laughs> I think we need some more CBDCs out there to see if it might all fit together. Uh, but secondly, it's uh, it would be a, it's be a long process that would require a lot of political will. Uh, what might perhaps be more uh, foreseeable, at least in um, the foreseeable future, would be the development of uh, payments platforms that uh, that exist in different regions, potentially with their their link interlinkages, or something uh, more ambitious than that. Just want to maybe pick up on one point that Panos made in his presentation, which I just want to express my agreement with. You know, there's nothing in the current international legal framework for cross-border payments that would require interoperability between CBDCs or necessarily CBDCs at all, or CBDCs that can be used for cross-border payments. I think the important point is that as countries issue CBDCs, we need to consider the international implications and what types of rules should apply. So maybe I'll stop there, thank you. I can just add um, to Ross and I was their perspective, you know, from a domestic standpoint. Um, and Lara, thanks for the great question. I would say convertibility between CBDCs and banknotes um, is a policy matter um, that is viewed as a, a worthwhile goal. It would not be a great outcome if CBDCs were issued and they were their own siloed, closed off system of money. I think an interesting policy question related to that would be convertibility between CBDCs and commercial bank deposits um, or other balances that might um, that end users might hold with their wallet provider or their intermediary. Um, should there be limits there, for example, just to make sure that CBDCs as a central bank liability in the safest form of money um, doesn't completely supplant um, commercial bank money, private money in the system. Uh, we've talked about interoperabilities, um, you know, the efficiencies, they bring network effects of positive sides, but there could also be um, downsides where, um, again, uh, central bank money dominates the system or looking cross border, dollarization occurs to the detriment of other jurisdictions. And that's where efficiencies, what interoperability brings, you know, maybe you don't want to take it to this maximum extent. Um, we've talked about limits, transaction limits, holding limits introducing inefficiencies to the system where interoperability is still there, but it's not as smooth and um, you know, free flowing that would allow for these um, bad outcomes. Thanks. Thank you very much for the, for the answer. As I'm pleased to see uh, there are further questions, so I suggest we move on to the next one. We already have to have a disclaimer about the right pronunciation of, of names, apologies. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Annalika Mui. If Annalika, if you could kindly ask your question. <clears throat> okay, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you so much for allowing me to ask a question. I'm very interested in the digital euro. But I was wondering, um, I actually have two questions. So with regard to storing this wallet, the, dig the digital euro in wallets, how would you prevent something that we're seeing right now in other virtual currencies, which is these non-custodian wallets, which allow users to be largely anonymous, if not fully anonymous, in their storage and transaction capacity? Is this a matter of law or is this a matter of technology? And if you allow wallets to store both digital currencies and other types of virtual currencies, would there be the risk of double legislation or how should legislation respond to this dual function of wallets? Thank you very much. Okay, who's the brave one? Serena, shall I or would you? All right. Um, oh my God, that, that goes with a lot of disclaimers. Um, you know, up, up to now, we do not have a, a technical design that will allow me to tell you that there will be a wallet or, or not. 
Um, whether you would allow anonymous wallets or not, you need to look at the AMLD as it currently stands in order to have um, a, an inspiration. And, you know, one could claim that for a very short, very, um, a, a very uh, small amounts, I think the, the current threshold is 150 uh, non-renewable monthly, et cetera, you could. Um, Above that, um, you would probably have, um, um, you know, uh, need for onboarding and need for uh, customer due diligence and for due diligence on the, the transaction as well. I think it's Article uh, 14. Uh, whether it can be anonymous in general, um, I, I, I think there are limits um, conceptually um, and you cannot fully replicate cash into a, a central bank digital currency because in a digital currency inevitably you could go down to the root of title the question is in accordance with current legislation whether you should be able to do it as a central bank and there i would just remind that um, you know privacy and data protection are fundamental rights under both the um, uh, uh, treaty, um, uh, the, the treaty for the functioning of the the EU, as well as Council of Europe uh, treaties, um, lots of disclaimers. Hopefully, hints of an answer. Hints by all means. Yeah. I can just uh, go ahead, Marina. Thank you. Yeah, I also find it incredibly um, difficult to answer, and, and I think I will just follow up on what Panos said. I think um, it is a mix of um, technical, uh, of being a technical matter, also a legal matter, but also a policy and even political matter, uh, to what extent uh, there should be fully anonymous um, uh, sort of non-custodian wallets. Now, um, as Panos said, there is clear, I, I will speak just from, from the legal perspective, there's clear limits uh, to, to how far anonymity can go and uh, there, there could be full anonymity when it comes to really small value uh, payments. Uh, then, of course, the question is how uh, small is small, um, but, but there are legal limits to, to such, such an institution. That would be my take on it. I, I would just add to, I think you teed up a great question. What is a supervisory, the regulatory wrapper that should apply to these intermediaries, these wallet providers? Um, and that's important because for one thing, we're talking about a central bank digital currency, a liability of the central bank. It's the face of the central bank to the general public, perhaps conveyed, perhaps custodied or accessed through this private sector intermediary. I think it's also important because we're talking about interoperability. When you have inter, when you have wallet providers, um, different entities within a system, a central bank digital currency system, each participant in the system poses risk exposures to each other uh, to the system more generally. So the regulatory supervisory, maybe eligibility standards that apply to a, a CBDC wallet provider, that's important both from an AML CFT standpoint when it comes to doing diligence on customers. But also to your second question, what other activities, what other, what other services can they provide? Um, one point, um, a point of comparison could be how banks, at least in the US, I imagine similar in the EU, are supervised today. There are legal permissibility limitations. They can't engage in anything they would like. Um, it's um, only certain activities that they may engage in for the benefit of being having a bank charter and accessing uh, Fed systems. There's also um, prudential safety and soundness um, supervision, um, and those are the guardrails that are in place. I think certainly as we think through um, CVDC wallet providers intermediaries, to the extent they engage in a smaller slice of activity or more limited range of services, perhaps they're not engaging in lending or money creation, then perhaps um, a smaller role, and I'm sure in the EU there are data points already um, that's lesser than full-scale bank regulation, but it is useful to think about the supervisory wrapper how it can, what should apply to an intermediary? How can it be tailored to their new roles and responsibilities with respect to a CBDC? Thank you, Jess. Uh, indeed, and in fact, just also occurred to me that, um, you know, like when it comes to uh, data protection standards um, and we are designing interoperability and there are different standards in different jurisdictions, what liability we might have 
if all of a sudden we cannot ensure in an interoperability context that the, that the data protection standards that we need to uphold, say in the Euro system, are also uphold uh, at the other end of the interoperability. Um, by this comforting thought. Uh, well, um, I see that we have st uh, still two more questions, and I suggest uh, you know let uh, let um, them be asked. And the next uh, person is Elke Tegela, who understands I have has a question. Hi, good afternoon. Um, in January 2022, the Euro Com European Commission published the European Declaration of Digital Rights and Principles for the Digital Decade, which is um, admittedly a political declaration. It's not a legal document yet, but some um, commentators see it already as a kind of magna charta for, for digital fundamental rights. And um, for those who are not familiar with this, um, one of the five points in this um, document, in the digital rights document, um, is promoting safer standards that give users the power over their data safe standards that give users power over the data. So Panos already mentioned um, data protection, which, which is important, but um, I, to my mind also comes the um, situation we have in Europe right now. Um, Chiara mentioned it in her introductory comments this morning. We discover that we are highly dependent on non-European partners, for example, in the energy market. Uh, we probably don't want to discover later on that we are highly dependent on non-European partners who run a platform um, that runs a future digital euro. And as a European citizen, I think um, we all want to be protected from non-European partners who may have um, too big a say in, in the technical run in the technical setup of this. Um, future digital euro and my my question would be i mean is this simply a policy choice or could one argue with something more high level maybe with fundamental rights that we all as european citizens have a right that our personal data not only our personal data our data is is protected from this and how is this taken into consideration Unless someone else is brave, I, I, I don't mind, you know, putting the, the elements of an answer. Um, I, I think, Elke, I, I hinted at that previously, saying that privacy and data protection are fundamental rights. Now, you will tell me, uh, you know, the letter of the law and the application are two different things, and, and in, a, in a time of, you know, severe technological progress, what does the letter of the, the treaty uh, mean in, in, in practice? Um, it will have to be, you know, seen how the, the various digital currencies are implemented and, and, and cross-operate. Um, uh, there are tools, but there are tools at a very granular uh, level. You know, what can you put at the cloud? Um, there are clear uh, guidelines on, you know, how you select, for example, your your cloud providers. Um, uh, is it fully and completely, uh, you know, without danger? Well, anytime you put personal data out there, you have some risk. Um, to, to end on a happy note, well, there is always cash, which is fully anonymous, and this is also a central banking product. So. You know, for the ones that are very, very uh, cautious, um, it's not that all um, uh, uh, issues and all exits to anonymity are blocked. Thank you, Paulos. Um, unless there is any intention to uh, continue the comments from, from the other panel members, then I suggest we move to the very last question. And if I understand correctly, Tonchitsa will uh, read it out. 
Uh, the lady is back. Uh, Claudia. Oh, is she? Okay. Well, uh, Claudia uh, Suarez would uh, would uh, answer her, her questions herself. Uh, sorry, to ask her question herself. Claudia, please. Hello. I think you can hear me now. Yeah. Uh, my my question was a bit on the outside, so I left it for the to the end. And if there were no more questions, there was time I would put it. Otherwise, I would just keep quiet. So my question is about the do no harm criteria and how far can this uh, criteria go? Um, mainly, I'm concerned about the environmental impact of the digital currencies. And uh, my question uh, is: is there are criterias being considered? Regarding this issue, the energy intensity of uh, digital currencies is this covered by the no arm criteria as well, or we will just stay by the principles that we have now uh, regarding the kind of energy that is used and the, the intensity? Because you already have a lot of problems to solve, as I see from the discussion. Thank you. Perhaps I can. Yeah. Would, should I take that one, Otto? Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for the question. I think it's a very interesting one. I think, of course, the should first be no, noted that the the do no harm uh, principle, it's been as it's been articulated in in recent papers, is something that's very new, particularly in the the cross border context. You know, the discussion so far is focused very much on economic issues, particularly the the effect on another country's economy or its balance of payments. Um, to my knowledge, it hasn't focused yet on broader considerations like um, the potential environmental impact of one uh, currency over another. There is, of course, an important domestic consideration in this regard as to what the environmental consequences of a CBDC will be. be, will be. Um, but it would, you know, the technology underlying the platform would uh, have, a, I think, a significant effect on the amount of energy used, if it's some sort of consensus mechanism versus something more um, uh, more streamlined and definite. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Russ. Um, then I, uh, I guess we uh, reached the end of our discussion uh, in this panel today. And thank you very much for uh, the very inspiring and illuminating uh, interventions. I think we uh, all enjoyed them and learned from it. And I can certainly promise that I will uh, think of this panel when the first time I will uh, pay with my, I will try to change my digital euro into dollar token at the electric charging station with a, for a self-driving vehicle in my holiday in the US. Um, let's hope uh, we get there soon. And uh, now it's time to uh, give the word to our Chiara who will understand, close this uh, intensive uh, day of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Otto. Thank you very much, everybody. It has been a pleasure to hear and to see you all. A lot of uh, good old friends uh, online. Uh, it was fascinating. We had to today the three panels that uh, uh, deal with the acceleration or the development of phenomena that from the legal point of view are particularly interesting. And we had fantastic experts from different continents as well. I also would like to thank the audience because the questions were quite challenging and uh, stimulating. So the wish is always don't stop here. Keep in mind those issues. Let's develop further. The book will come later, but uh, let's keep in contact. And especially don't forget to join us tomorrow because we have three more panels. They will not focus on the follow up or developments of COVID, but more on issues related to rule of law. But it is a very fascinating area also for lawyers. Thank you to all and uh, a well-deserved end of the afternoon. And um, thank you, Chair, for giving me the floor. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.